Last year, the FDA approved of lecanemab, or lecembi, for the treatment of Alzheimer's after an accelerated approval process, which was later changed to a traditional approval process. This drug has made waves in the pharmaceutical industry and marks a very exciting turning point in the drug development for the treatment of Alzheimer's. But there's a lot going on with the drug from both a scientific and drug development perspective, so today I'm going to talk about Alzheimer's, the mechanism of this new drug, its relevancy in the pharmaceutical world, and what it means for the future of Alzheimer's. So first we need to understand Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a form of dementia characterized by progressive memory impairment and cognitive decline. This can include symptoms such as forgetting names and places, poor judgment, and trouble remembering recent events. From a treatment-focused perspective, you can break the pathology of Alzheimer's into two main categories, amyloid pathology and tau pathology. Amyloid pathology is characterized by the presence of amyloid beta or A-beta plaques in the brain. These plaques begin as normal amyloid proteins that are typically produced by the brain, except in Alzheimer's they fold incorrectly and accumulate outside of neurons. Since they form outside of the cells, they are described as extracellular. These plaques are non-homogenous, meaning they vary in structure and are composed of a variety of types of bad-acting amyloids. These amyloid beta molecules can exist as individual molecules called soluble monomers, as larger soluble aggregates, or as larger insoluble fibrils. All of these tend to clump together with one clump begetting more clumps in a process called nucleation, sort of like a snowball tumbling down a hill and accumulating more snow as it goes. In the end, you have many clumps of amyloid beta throughout the brain squished between neurons, causing damage to the brain. Now, tau pathology, on the other hand, is very similar to A beta, but structurally unique. It is also naturally produced by the body, we call this endogenous, but deviates from its natural function when it becomes hyperphosphorylated and, again, clumps together. This clumping is more structured and takes a sort of branching conformation instead of the non-homogeneous clumping that we see in A beta. Tau is also different because it forms inside of neurons, or intracellularly, instead of extracellularly. The intracellular clumps of tau are called tau tangles, and they essentially suffocate the neuron from the inside, thus preventing their normal function. The buildup of these amyloid plaques and tau tangles occurs before cognitive decline is even detected, so people can be living their normal lives while AD pathology is beginning in their brain. The progression can be demonstrated with this graph. Here, the red line shows amyloid buildup, teal shows tau, blue is showing neuronal dysfunction, and purple showing cognitive decline or symptoms that you would actually see in the patient. In the progression of Alzheimer's, the red line representing amyloid plaques is the first to increase, followed by tau, and finally cognitive decline is the last thing to occur. Now, there are many other factors that go into the biology of Alzheimer's, including neuroinflammation, which is thought to be both a cause and effect of Alzheimer's, but plaques and tangles are the two of the most well-studied and tend to be the target for most drugs. When we look at the chronological progression of things, it seems sort of simple. Plaques form, then tangles form, then neurons die, then symptoms start. If plaque precedes any symptoms, we can reason to guess that if we get rid of those plaques and tangles, we can get rid of the downstream symptoms. This is called the amyloid hypothesis. The amyloid hypothesis is the idea that amyloid plaques cause Alzheimer's. And unfortunately, it's not that simple. The idea that amyloid beta accumulation is the primary cause of Alzheimer's has a troubled history in the scientific community. In fact, there's a lot of evidence that removing the plaques doesn't actually cure Alzheimer's. And one of the main pieces of evidence for this is 20 years of drug research, over the course of which we have successfully attacked the plaques, but never ended up actually curing the disease. All of these failed attempts to stop Alzheimer's by targeting amyloid has seeded doubt in the scientific community about the validity of the A-beta hypothesis. So that brings us to the new drug, lecanemab, a drug that coincidentally targets amyloid plaques. Here's how it works. Lecanemab is a monoclonal antibody. You'll notice the drug name ends in MAB, and that's because of its nature as a monoclonal antibody. It's an antibody similar to the endogenously produced human antibody called human IgG1, except with a few key modifications. The FAB region of this antibody, the region which can be modified to target specific molecules, is designed to attach to A beta. Specifically, it binds to toxic A beta, preferably those soluble aggregates, and once it binds, 
flags them for removal. The removal is then achieved by the brain's resident immune cells called microglia. Essentially, this drug allows the immune system to recognize the amyloid beta aggregates as something to be eliminated. Now, in order for this to function as a treatment, the treatment has to occur early in the progression of disease, basically as soon as symptoms are starting. Remember, amyloid plaques are the first thing to occur in Alzheimer's, before symptoms even start. So the idea is to start clearing those plaques before the disease can really take hold. Once a patient has already experienced neuronal cell death, the removal of plaques will not magically resurrect the affected neurons. So ideally, patients would be in a stage of symptoms called mild cognitive impairment. There are some obvious drawbacks to this mechanism, mainly being that it's designed to prevent progression and not treat Alzheimer's, but it's certainly a start. So in a nutshell, lecanemab removes amyloid plaques and as a result slows down the progression of Alzheimer's. Now, the reason this drug was so huge for the scientific community is because it provides some of the first really solid evidence in support of the amyloid hypothesis. By removing the plaques, we improve Alzheimer's. Supporters of the amyloid hypothesis rejoice. But let's talk more about that term, improving Alzheimer's. We can understand the level of improvement directly by looking at the clinical trials for this drug. In the clinical trials, every two weeks, patients received an hour-long IV infusion of lecanemab. It's dosed intravenously in order to get it directly into the bloodstream and avoid what's called first-pass metabolism, or the breakdown of molecules by our stomach and intestinal organs. Over the course of this treatment for 18 months, several outcomes were measured, but we'll only talk about a few. First is amyloid pathology. Patients experienced a significant reduction in what's called amyloid burden in the brain. In order to experience a reduction, patients must already have an accumulation of A-beta in the brain. This is most commonly measured by an A-beta PET scan. So patients who already demonstrated A-beta buildup experience a significant reduction in their amyloid burden. This is the desired outcome. The second measure is cognitive decline. Cognitive decline is a bit less definitive and is measured using a test designed by physicians to assess the progression of dementia. It's called the Clinical Dementia Rating Sum of Boxes, or CDRSB. By administering this test repeatedly over time, they can measure the change over time in cognitive ability. Here's the data we received from the clinical trials. In this graph, a greater score would indicate more change, aka more cognitive decline. Please note that the x-axis starts at 2 and decreases as it goes up the axis, so lower down on this graph indicates worse cognitive function and more cognitive decline from baseline. The data shows that with lecanemab, cognitive decline occurred at a slower rate than with the placebo treatment. Essentially, we are seeing about a 25% reduction in rate of decline. Now, this is not a reduction in symptoms, rather a reduction in how fast symptoms are starting. While many laboratory scientists see this as huge support for the amyloid hypothesis, physicians are less happy. To a physician who actually sees patients, cognitive decline is still occurring at a dangerous rate, and some physicians even claim that this change might be imperceivable to patients. So I'll allow you to make your own conclusions on the validity of the claim that this drug reduces cognitive decline, but remember that when you're facing a neurodegenerative disease, any little thing that slows it down is meaningful. Now, lastly, we have to talk about side effects, and this is also something that will probably make you feel a little disappointed. We've been studying amyloid in Alzheimer's for a while, so long that we have a name for the specific side effect you get when you try to remove amyloid plaques. We call it ARIA, which stands for Amyloid Related Imaging Abnormalities. ARIA is characterized by fluid or swelling in the brain and sometimes even bleeding. As you might have guessed, these are extremely dangerous and can even lead to death. With ARIA, many patients have symptoms such as headache and confusion, but sometimes they won't necessarily show these symptoms. And in the case of Alzheimer's, where headache and confusion are already incredibly common, these symptoms can be hidden from their care providers. So, lecanemab unfortunately did increase incidence of ARIA significantly, and it even led to investigators unblinding the study so that participants and physicians could monitor more closely for prevention. This means that patients were allowed to know if they were on the placebo or the drug itself. There are other side effects such as infusion-related reaction, but at the risk of sounding like a pharmaceutical advertisement, I'll spare you. Really, ARIA is the most relevant to this conversation. An interesting side note on side effects is that genetics seem to play a role in whether or not patients would get them. 
Patients with ApoE4 gene were more likely to have side effects than people without the gene. Now, ApoE4 is a gene that's very commonly associated with Alzheimer's and it's well studied, so this does not necessarily come as a shock to the scientific community. However, it does shed light in the mechanism of Alzheimer's and will provide an interesting path forward for people studying the connection between amyloid pathology and ApoE4. But back to the point. Overall, we know that lecanemab reduces amyloid plaques, slows the rate of cognitive decline, if only slightly, and unfortunately does increase aria. So how does that compare to other drugs that treat amyloid plaques? Well, there's only one other drug on the market right now that uses a beta therapy to treat Alzheimer's, and this is called adikenemab or adahelm. Adikenemab, like lecanemab, is made by Biogym and Isai and has similarities to lecanemab. First off, it's also a monoclonal antibody, you can hear that in its name, that it also ends in M-A-B, and it also targets amyloid plaques. Wait a minute, I thought that lecanemab was the first of its kind. Well, not technically, but adikenemab was a drug full of controversy and false promises which I'll talk about now. Although it had already been approved by the FDA for patients in 2021, this year in 2024, adikenemab will be discontinued by its manufacturers. How it got approved in the first place is incredibly questionable as it garnered many safety and efficacy concerns even in the clinical trials. Mainly, it had more side effects, specifically more incidence of aria. And many people complained that the labeling to warn them of this prevalence of these side effects was not clear enough. Given that a little over 41% of patients in the phase 3 trial experienced aria, this would require extremely clear warnings. Additionally, it didn't seem to be all that effective. In fact, the FDA explicitly acknowledged no consistent clinical benefits occurred over their 18-month clinical trial for adikenemab. So, the only other amyloid drug on the market causes extreme side effects and barely works. Oh, and did I mention it's almost $29,000 a year? Interestingly, despite its sturdy track record with adikenemab, Biogen is again partnering with ISI to develop and produce their new anti-amyloid therapy, lecanemab. Let's hope they have more luck this time. In my opinion, it's very likely they will have more success with this one. The FDA was more cautious in this round, or at least they claim to be, in light of the anikenemab failures, and the side effects of lecanemab are much less common. Most importantly, unlike adikenemab, lecanemab actually seems to work. There are other drugs on the market for Alzheimer's, many of them cholinesterase inhibitors, which work to increase brain levels of acetylcholine. They do this by inhibiting the activity of the enzyme cholinesterase, which typically works to break down acetylcholine in the brain. Acetylcholine is a very powerful neurotransmitter and is associated with concentration, so drugs that increase acetylcholine work to increase concentration. This means that acetylcholine-based drugs don't work to stop the progression of Alzheimer's, but rather address the symptoms so that the burden of living with Alzheimer's is reduced. But back to amyloid therapies. Lecanemab is really the first of its kind to successfully use anti-A beta therapy to induce cognitive changes in patients. While the rest of the therapies focused on treating symptoms, this drug is working to treat the root cause, or what we think might be the root cause. This is a step in the right direction. In the future, we can probably expect more therapies that hone in on A-beta plaques and more funding for that aim of research. There is also the possibility that A-beta can be used in conjunction with other therapies. I talked in the beginning about tau, the chronologically second aspect of Alzheimer's. Therapies that target tau are in development and have real promise. A therapy that targets tau in conjunction with a therapy that targets A-beta could potentially change the game for Alzheimer's treatment. And going even further in the future, potential therapies may take into consideration the genetics of patients. Take ApoE4, for example, which I mentioned earlier. As we learn more about the mechanism through which ApoE4 interacts with Alzheimer's, we may learn more about the specific treatment that would be fitting for people with certain genetic factors. There are many genes that interact with Alzheimer's, and these could all be potential avenues for treatment. The big takeaway is that this is a small step, but a small step in the right direction. More than 100 years out from when Aloise Alzheimer's first discovered plaques under the microscope in 1909, we are finally taking the first steps towards addressing those plaques, and I'm really excited to see where we go next.
there's a lot to think about here and I would love to have a conversation or answer questions in the comments section as this topic is very near and dear to my heart. I worked on it for the past year. Thank you all for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.